Has one of your children ever been obsessed with dinosaurs? When you were younger, did you dream of being a paleontologist? Are you a homeschool family? Well, maybe next year you could join us. We got to be part of an amazing event in Glen Rose, Texas. This was the Veritas Homeschool Dinosaur Track Excavation with Dr. Ball through the Creation Evidence Museum. And it was so much fun. Can you imagine walking where dinosaurs walked and getting to excavate new footprints that have never been found before? Well, we got to do just that. The Veritas Homeschool Dinosaur Track Excavation is an annual event. Last year was the first year in 2021, and we've got to be part of both years. We loved it so much last year that we made sure to invite even more of the family to come along with us. We learned about some of the special tools you needed for the excavation so that you don't harm the tracks when you find them, but are still able to clean them out well. We started in an area where a lot of the tracks had already been discovered by other groups, but it gave us a good chance to clean them out and learn how to use our tools. It was so great to meet so many families throughout the week who came to learn about the excavation and be part of the dig. The weather was definitely warm this year in 2022. However, in 2021, we were all wearing sweaters because it rained all week. So if you want to come, definitely keep an eye on the weather. This is Texas after all, and sometimes you just never know what the weather's going to do. I was so happy my mom and dad actually got to come on this dig. My mom even brought her all-terrain walker with her and was able to make it to the dig site. It was pretty impressive. This is Dr. Carball, and he was such a pleasure to be with and definitely a wealth of knowledge. The heel spur goes all the way back there, and then it goes out there, here, and he actually had two more claws, but they were filled in there. They were shown in other areas. This is such a beautiful area for the dig. We're right beside the Paloxi River. This is a family we met last year on the dig and we're so blessed to be able to work with them again. They actually found these tools really handy last year in 2021 when it rained and we had to clear all the water out. It looks like it came in handy again. Even though it was hot and it looked good, we had to stay out of the river for now because we were working and the Biloxi River was kind of off limits while we were doing our job. It was so hot and bright, my cameras kept overheating and it was really hard to see my screens. I thought it was really cool that my mom's walker actually becomes a chair too. Team, it's noon time and it's going to get hot. <laughs> That little one is scruffy, everyone's favorite part of the team. Later that night. Do you understand how rare it is to work with one of them? Yeah. Which one did you clean up? The one that where you stepped on the turtle? 
In the evening, we came back to the museum and we got to see certain special things and hear special speakers. The first night, we got to go into the new kids area that's being built for hands-on things. On the wall, you can see a big mural that was painted and it's really awesome. One of my favorite parts though, is that there are pictures on it from the first year's excavation. And if you look right there, you might see a couple of familiar faces. That's me and my son. I love how one-on-one -on -one this experience is. Everyone is welcome to ask questions. And I love hearing the kids ask questions especially. It's so fun. In order to have a bona fide fossil lab where you work on bones, make discoveries with those bones, you also must have archives where the original bones are found, where scholars can then examine those and repeat the experiments. Science is a lot about repeating experiments. They will go three decks of them on this side. We'll be sure not to strike you with the laser. On this side, three levels of them, like that there, and here. And they'll be filled with dinosaur bones in jackets. The bones, components of 19 different dinosaurs. That's more than most of the major universities in the world. But God gave them to us with first the Acrocanthosaurus discovered uh, 2.9 miles upstream from where we're digging. And then from there, the next and the next. God just continues to work. So we wanted this to be a live situation. So we made it a children's lab. Notice the beautiful granite table. We just acquired this from a conservator friend of mine, but this came from Egypt. And this came from Egypt. Uh, this, anybody want to guess who that Pharaoh is represented? Yeah. II. You're right. And he is here battling the Hittites. All of that's described in hieroglyphics. Battling the Hittites. And he was able to subdue them. Ramesses the second. Ramesses the great. And so before he died, he deified himself. So he had his image here on the throne uh, covered with gold. So we're going to display this up in the section Israel is special because uh, these pharaohs, of course, hounded the Israelites. Do you recognize anybody? This was from the dig last year. Do you recognize those kids? <laughs> that yeah. That's right? us, yeah. <laughs> All right, way to go. This is the primary dinosaur of the Glen Rose Basin. Anybody know his name? Acrocanthosaurus. Acrocanthosaurus. Right. that you expose today that were tridactyl, three toed, mm -hmm. were made by Acrocanthosaurus. The big round tracks were made by Sarpocidin, and there's more to it. Proteus. 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 Now, he's not the biggest of all the dinosaurs, but he was the tallest, and Three of his neck bones were discovered in Oklahoma. They were so big, they put them in the basement of the uh, university lab because they thought they were logs. They yeah. figure around. And this is a model of the pre-flood world. It's in this room that many of the lectures will be given on what the world was like before the flood. These are wonderful questions. Yes. How do we know? Because the scripture uses the term in Genesis 1 when God said, let there be a permanent. He uses the word Nathan in conjunction with that permanent when he's talking about the starlight. Nathan or Nathan in Hebrew means to add and to yield. Because of the nature of that crystal canopy, and every family needs one of those books. That we have um, because of the nature you can see stars that are long long distance light years from us in their actual color aurora borealis uh, you, you can see that all around the globe 
total multiplication. There are certain conditions where if you have the right chemistry and you have the right energy, each photon introduces a cascade in that crystal. It's photomultiplication. So the tiniest dot could be seen as a whole galaxy. If you will look over here, this is the so-called descent of man. The Darwinian concept, you have seen this hundreds, probably thousands of times, uh, television, newspapers, uh, magazines, etc. The idea that from an ape-like creature, and also look at the sea, life developed, the descent of man came to the point where, here we are. But if you will notice, everything from here back has an X beside it. Even in the technical, secular literature, every one of those has been crossed out. Now, they don't say much about it. They have more faith than we have. They just say, well, uh, even though there's a question about this, we'll find something else that will take its place. So they leave it in place. Everything there, you may want to take time to read those brief descriptions. Here is Lucy, the poster child. That's all they found of Lucy. Everything about Lucy is ape-like. From the shape of her jaw, the size of her teeth, the shape and dimension of her skull, everything, her arms, everything about it. Here's Neanderthal man. We have 1,350 cc's of cranial capacity. He had 1,450 cc's. Cro-Magnon had 1,650 cc's. And we're getting worse. <laughs> now, the reason I started the museum is expressed right here. Down here, as I described to you today on the hot uh, ledge along Paluxy. the Paluxy, and uh, we discovered a trail of human footprints among dinosaur footprints. Here are some original tracks. We were able to take these out. This, this tells the basic story. These are originals. Every one of these has been subjected to spiral CAT scan to show that the compression density under them is genuine. Here's an 11 and a half inch human footprint. This is the delt track, great toe, second, third, fourth, little toe. How many toes do you have? Five, and he had five. Are you a human? So he's a human. Okay, and that's the metatarsal arch, medial section of the longitudinal arch, lateral section. So here, the man stepped first, but then the dinosaur, the Acrocanthosaurus, stepped on and pushed into his track. We know that because he pushed up some of that consolidated mud from the human track. So uh, we have spiral cat scan showing the compression is there. You can carve a track, but you can't fabricate the compression under each of these tracks. Here, the man stepped first and the dinosaur stepped. But down here, this is actually my favorite. A pterosaur stepped in four digits with a web under spiral cat scan, even that webbed forefoot shows. That's the hallux heel area. You remember today, did you notice there was a flange behind that extended out? That's the reason we knew they were pterosaur tracks. Here's that flange. It's like a spur. And so he stepped first, then the human being stepped on his track. Every specialist lab where we've taken this, every specialist in the lab has said after viewing this and this, there's no question, that's genuine. And they are experts at determining the compression underneath. So this destroys evolutionary theory. Okay, so you want to go in the biosphere. Yeah. All right. Let's be very careful. Follow me. that we built years ago to run the first experiments. We changed eight parameters, or we tweaked eight parameters. In the medical chambers today at the universities and the university hospitals, they changed two parameters. 
what were the oxygen? Oxygen and atmospheric pressure. You can see from this coil, we also work with the Earth's DC magnetic field. Outside in the corner is a piece of equipment only one light in the world. And it generates the DC current and it's transferred in here. Notice this is offset. It's not in the very center. There's the center. It's offset. And the reason being, this is a scientific experiment. And we want to see if the insects and animals gravitate toward this or away from it. We want to see if the plants hanging here gravitate toward it or away from it and the plants that will be over here. Jim Huff said he would like to put a dozen cameras and a dozen microphones in here when it's online. So that with an app, you will be able, at home or in your classroom, anywhere in the world, to log on and watch what's going on in this biosphere. <laughs> in the first one, we, we had rattlesnakes and copperheads in there for four weeks. Professor Amy Clark came down from the University of Illinois, and he said, uh, why don't you milk the snakes? I said, I don't milk snakes. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, no, why don't you have the snakes built and see if there's any change in their venom? And I said, well, it's really too early. I had taught that it would take the third generation before we could really see any difference in the venom of the snakes. Most great discoveries are made serendipitously. <laughs> Now that's a very fancy word. What does it mean? Fortunate accident. By accident, right. And we've got a logical sequence to what we're, we think we're talking about. But really, none of us totally understand the wonderful world of God. Uh, I had Dr. Robert Popperwell and Bob Summers milk the snakes. I photographed them. And Amy Clark and I, Professor Clark and I, took them up to an independent lab in Dallas. A week later, they called me and said, you've got to come back up here. Okay. Went back up. Said, look what you've done. Has anyone here ever seen a snake venom under scanning electron microscopic analysis? Sin. Anyone? It's gnarled like spaghetti, like that. So, the professor said, here is the control group that you milk. You see students to be scientific, you've got to have an experiment, but you've got to have a control to see how it's different. So 40 miles away were the same brothers and sisters of the snakes, 40 miles away, not in a biosphere like this. So their venom was all gnarled like that. But he said, look at what you've done with the biospheres. Their venom was completely orchestrated like that. Theoretically, theoretically that means that their venom was now a serum and was not toxic because it's the frayed ends that are toxic. So we took the control venom and then the biosphere venom, put three PhDs on it. They ran electrophoresis, the Western block test. Anybody know what the Western block test is? That's where you make a gel of the material, you run a DC current through it, and then the results come out in graphs. So he called me back up and said, you gotta, I've got to publish on this. He said, look what you've done by just having the snakes in the biosphere. He said, this graph, from the biosphere snake compared to the control group, you have enhanced that protein expression. That's like if you want a lot of hair, you have more in the previous world. He said, in this one, you have diminished what's in the control group. That's like if you have a wart on your face and you want it all, just go back to the previous world. It won't be there. You can like that. He said, in this one, you have completely eliminated 
what was in the control group, but he said, this is what got our attention. In this one, you have expressed a protein that is not expressed in the control group. That means that when you have a living organism that expresses something better than what it's compared to, it has not evolved. The information was already in genetic expression. Okay. Did everybody get that? No. Let's see, and then we'll go home. Because this is hyperbolic. That is, the ends are curved, so the sound is picked up by your ears, and you can see on the key keys. Glory, glory, This was such an awesome event, and we're just thrilled to be part of it. Join us next time. More to come. And remember, if you haven't had a chance to yet, please hit that thumbs up, subscribe, ring that notification bell, comment down below, share with a friend. And remember, let it go and keep moving forward. Have a magical day. Bye.